Today we will visit the Yukon in the Northwest Territories in Canada. And we will pay a visit to Dawson City, the Wild West of the North. We will go back in time and see how the Big Stampede or Cold Rush could happen just like that. And how was it possible that a little village could grow from 500 souls to 30,000 in two years time? And we're gonna paint a lonely guy searching for gold in the Christie Lake in Tombstone. Let's dive into this cold and lonely place. My name is Michael Schutte and thank you for watching Painting the Island. Hello and welcome in my studio. Today we're going to start a new adventure. We will visit all the provinces and territories of Canada, starting with the Yukon. We're going to paint a very cold mountain, even a cold river and a poor guy with a cold pen trying to get some cold out of the river. Of course, I tried it myself too. And we found some stuff, but it was only worth $2.50 not really striking it rich. As always, we have a lot to do, so we dive right into it and at work. We're gonna paint a mountain range. And like the Dutch masters, I like a low horizon. It gives the painting more perspective power. We use a stick as a ruler and with a bit of gray and a small round brush, we can sketch the horizon. Now we won't see much of this horizon anymore but we know it's there. Later I will explain more about this. With a big one inch brush we can start with the sky and this time we will work with grays. The light is coming from the right so we have to keep an eye on that. So the highlights right and the shadows left. We can start with a light glow above the mountains and we push the paint into the canvas. I already gave the canvas a very light grayish undertone. You might try that too and see if you like it. Then we set up roughly some dark tones for the clouds. Yes, it's gonna get dark here. If you like gruesome, lonely, cold places, well, you came to the right place. But there is beauty in everything. Although, that is the optimistic view of us painters, right? So we keep on going, spreading the foundation color for this cold and cold sky. And yes, it looks ugly, but like I said, it's just a foundation. In the right corner is more light. So we use a bit of ochre tones, and by now you know how to mix that. It's just yellow ochre, a light and crimson, and we add white till we have three or four tones. With this same light ochre tone, we can paint a light above the dark mountain who is still not there, for a great contrast. We can use a filbert brush for more smooth tones, and now we can make more tones into the gray mesh. It's still foundation, so no worries, the real clouds will come later. We can paint some light strokes through the gray with soft movements. In the right corner, we can add even more light as the late sunlight or maybe the early morning light comes from behind those mountains. And this will give that magic light what you often see in those northern mountain areas. Yes, I'm still busy with the foundation. Ugly, I know, but we have to think three-dimensional. Enough background, let's get serious. We want some killer clouds rolling in over the mountains, chasing every tourist away. So that our lonely coal digger will be all alone by himself in this harsh wilderness. And with dark grey and a tiny bit of purple, we push these clouds with a filbert brush into our foundation. And suddenly it's a total different ball game. And as we work wet and wet, the grey will melt away into the underlayer. And more to the right, we can use some lighter grey. 
let's make this space above the mountains a bit lighter. Because we want a kind of glow above these mountain ranges. And if we think it's enough, we can go over the surface with a so-called fluffy brush. This is a kind of ladies makeup brush, but it works great to make the sky more smooth. And let's do a bit more light reflections in the clouds. Even in the darkest cloud is always some reflection. So let's take advantage of that. Now keep on blending to make it all soft and over every blending we can paint another layer. Now that is the beauty of oil paint. Now let's do a tiny bit of light here and let's fluff it in again. I don't know if fluffing is a good English word but you will get it. We give one more total blending and then we can start working on the mountains. Later we can always go back and work more in the sky if, we, if necessary. Now watch this technique. With the filbert brush flat on the surface we can bring up shake it brush the dark mountain in the left. We scratch the surface which can be a bit tricky because the paint doesn't cover the surface right away. Down the slope we can slide the paint more out holding the filbert brush in a more convenient way. We can use a mix of black, burnt sienna, a bit of grey and down below on the slope we can do some green. It's just a foundation or under layer, so don't pay too much attention now. And let's move forward to the dark main mountain in the middle. That's quite a piece of work. This rough volcanic piece of ancient stone is a real dark object. If you take a canoe on this lake, you might have the feeling that you are in Jurassic Park. Any moment a group of dinosaurs can show up. It's an amazing world over there. And the cool thing is that you can enjoy absolute silence. We don't realize it, but we have sound pollution everywhere. Cars, airplanes, motorbikes, engines and whatever is out there. And we don't realize it anymore. But here it is, absolute silence. Only the wind, the water and the birds give you this nature symphony of absolute relaxing silence. There are a few places in the world where you can experience this phenomenon and certainly this is one of them. For me, coming from Amsterdam, the city that never sleeps, yes like New York, it was a refreshing, healing experience. In the meantime I set up a few more rocky mountains and I fade out the lower part to create, create a kind of mist. Mist is always fantastic. And I worked away a little UFO because I dropped the painting brush. Yeah, shame. Okay, let's move on with some more mist because we kind of give that mountain and second layer. With the one inch brush we can blend this slope in, but first I want to go back to that right mountains. With a small filbert brush we can put up some more snow and mist and we use phthalo blue and titanium white for that. Now watch my technique, when we bring up the snow we shake the filbert brush into the grey. Very simple. In the foreground we can go a bit darker and this will push back the background mountains. Yes, it's a pretty complicated piece of rock over there but it's a nice challenge for a boy from Amsterdam growing up in mud and water but I do my best. So we keep on going painting little snow slopes and rocks till we think it's enough. We will come back and forward in these mountains as we have to avoid that the paint gets too muddy. And maybe in the foreground there is a slope of arctic moss. We shall see. 
Let's give this ancient massive some structure. Where necessary, we can add dark and light because this mountain has lots of indents and cracks, but that will make it so interesting. The light comes from the right, so with plain black and a small filbert brush, we can move forward to make the cracks deeper. The front part catches more light. We don't go right away to the lightest color and I know it's a temptation to do so, but we better start with a middle tone bluish gray and then we use slowly the lighter tones and a fantastic snow tone is always titanium white with some phthalo blue. And with snow and rock painting you cannot avoid it, we gonna play with a knife. At the start it can be a bit nerve wracking, but if you practice a bit it will work for you. We scrape a little roll of paint from the palette and then we let it scratch over the wet surface with almost no pressure. Then the knife will do the work for you creating absolute fantastic snow and rock slopes. And if you ever need help, well you know where to find me. Yeah, the knife works fantastic with snow, but also with rocks. And I said it before, no pressure and a lot of practicing. It's time to relax. We take a little break and let me tell you about an interesting part of Canadian history. The big stampede or gold rush. Enjoy. Now let's see how you start a gold rush. Yes, this is a handbook to get rich, so pay attention. You stroll around in a river and suddenly you see a glittering in the sunlight. And yes, it's gold. You only have to bend to pick it up. Jim Skokum or Jim Mason or Kish found gold in Rabbit Creek in 1896. Later it was named Bonanza Creek. Now, a secret in those days was hard to keep it a secret. So after a magazine article screaming gold, 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 the gold rush was born. So what do you do in 1897? The world is in crisis, you don't earn nothing. So you lay down your work, you leave your family business or whatever, and then you have to stand in line for a claim at the community hall in Victoria. And okay, it's quite busy, but the mood is great, so you wait because you wanna get rich in an easy way. Then you take an overcrowded boat to Port Dia or Skagway over a rough sea. So yes, you might get a bit seasick or you even drown. And if you finally arrive in Port Deal or Skagway, you have to buy at least 2000 pounds of survival stuff to complete the stampede. Now you have to choose how to get to Dawson City. You can do the Yukon River, or if you like to climb steep hills, you can do the Chilkoot Pass trails. By law, you need to get up a year's supply of food to prevent starvation, it weighs around a ton. So yes, you might have to do this steep climb a couple of times in a temperature of minus 30. See it positive. As you don't freeze, you will build up a hell of a condition. Now if you don't feel like climbing, you can stay at the local campground. Yes, it's a bit cold, muddy and overcrowded and with minus 40, not really a place for the faint at heart. You have to stay there and wait until the ice will melt in spring. Then you have to get or build your own boat and sail the white water of the Yukon and sail down to Klondike. And be advised, take care that your raft or boat is solid because it's gonna get rough. No experience? Well, after this wild, wild water adventure, you will be a seasoned captain. And when you finally arrive in Dawson, you will see that it's pretty muddy and overcrowded. You will discover that the city grew from 500 souls in 96 to around 30,000 people in 1898. 
So yeah, you won't find gold anymore in the rivers. So you have to dig into the permafrost to discover that there's not much gold there. And after a massive burn down of Dawson City, you will decide to go home again. Disappointed? Well, thousands went home broke. Yes, broke and poor, they lost everything. But at least they were still alive. And as usual, only a few hundred people were lucky enough to make it. Those were the entrepreneurs who built the hotels and the general stores. And there were lots of strong women like Miss Belinda Mulroney, the richest lady of the Klondike, who even built a bank. Yes, ladies, girl power was already there in the Wild West. Nowadays, Dawson is a touristic place and yes, there is still coal to find. But you better leave it to the pros. And there's even a ferry and if you might strike it rich, you can go to this place to see how much it's all worth. There's even a plug for the first coal digger, Jim Mason. As well, Jim Skokum or Kish how he was named. Jim had a lot of nicknames, but I think Jim Skokum was the best well-known nickname. So I gave you a short ride over the Great Bonanza and no, it was not always a pretty experience, but all those brave men and women who tried it and survived it earn our deepest respect and they had a good story to tell to their grandkids. Now let's go back to our own coal digger. That coal digger has to wait a while. First of all, we have to work on the background mountains. The hills on the right have that special northern light. And we can take advantage of this by highlighting the snow. The front mountains have a lot of heavy indents. And we can do this with a small round brush and of course a dark tone. And while it's still wet, we can scrape some rough edges with the knife especially here on the right side where the light is catched by the corner. Now before I forget to tell you, if you search up the movie The Gold Rush of Charlie Chaplin, you can see what a master he was in comedy. It's a silent movie, only with piano melodies as some background music, but this great actor-producer was really fantastic and change a dramatic period of history into a hilarious slapstick. I saw it and I was surprised about the quality and speed. Let's work on the mossy and grassy slide of the left side. We use a filbert brush and take care because this slide has a lot of different tones. At the top it's ultra dark and below it's ultra light. Just mix some dark grays, even black, and then play with the light green tones down at the bottom. We can use a bit of extra medium to make it slick because we can do amazing effects with the knife, but as you might know by now, the knife needs a slick and wet underground. Over the slope, we can use a lighter green or even some ochre tones. If you need a far away greenish or mossy tone, we can do a mix of black and yellow ochre. Try it out for yourself. Then we scrap a little roll of paint of the palettes and with a very light touch we slide over the wet surface. Now hold your knife with three fingers and I told it before, no pressure. And then we can create the most fantastic fantastic effects. And with the filbert brush we can create some slopes in between with a darker tone. With a lot of different tones we can create a vivid background in this grey world. Especially at the front side where the light is really touching the ground we can even use a highlight tone. So play around with the knife and see what you like most. In fact, it's only a few colors what we use, but this will take care of a relaxing composition. In the slopes, we can scratch with a knife to make it more rough. And in the front left, 
we can even make it a bit darker. The cool effect of the knife is that it staples up the layers in a very pretty way. We never will achieve this with a brush, the paint crumbles and that makes it so very special. We do a few highlights and then it's time to take a refreshing dive into the water. The freezing water. With a stick, as a ruler, we can draw a pretty straight line with some bluish left grey and then we can make it a bit wider with a small filbert brush. The overall color of the lake is a dark or light at the top bluish grey color and with a filbert brush we can bring it up with straight brush strokes. First firm pressure and then very loosely blend it in. It's a bit boring to look at, so let's speed up a little bit, but you will get the idea anyway. Like I said, at the top of the water it's always lighter. At the bottom it's always darker. This is an optical effect. Try it for yourself. If you ever see a lake or a river or the sea, look globally over the water and see how light it is at the horizon and how dark it is at the bottom. And like I said, it's an optical illusion, but very strong. I will tell you, I had a lot of requests to show how to paint stones under the water. Well, this might be a good opportunity to show you how, as we have giant stones just under the surface. I will show you that later because First we have to paint a couple of stones at the right part just above the water. But in the meantime we are still busy to paint that grey. And the grey has different depths. I give them different dark tones where the water is really deep. And some lighter tones when the water is less deep. And we keep, keep on going, keep on blending, that's really important. And now it's time for the first piece of soil sticking out into the water. With a small round brush we can put up a piece of moss and rock. Then there's a whole bunch of rocks spread all over the place and we simply do this as a foundation with some black tones to start with. Now we don't want to do too much details yet over the wet underground we can scratch some light colors, maybe some grey and ochre tones with a knife. Later we will add more grasses and weeds and whatever grows on these bald naked rocks. And we can soften the edges with a tiny round brush. Sometimes the knife is a bit too rough, but we can always repair everything. As this part is probably an outlet for a little creek into the lake, we can create small ripples in the water around the rocks. Maybe it's the wind or current, it doesn't matter, it looks good. And again, no pressure. Let's put up a few other big rocks. These big guys sticking out of the water are fantastic for a perspective effect. And above all, we need something to sit on for our prospector when he's doing his cold panning. We can hardly imagine how it is to sit there for days or weeks in the cold and freezing wind, staring in that cold pan with the hope to catch a few nuggets. I tried it myself, but after a few hours everything starts to hurt. Your knees, arms and neck feel like they burn. And maybe you don't know how it works, well you look for those tiny black rock scrapes in the pan. They have the same weight as gold. And if you shake it and pay attention, you will see in between those black rock stuff some small little shiny nuggets. But it's all very eeny meeny and boy you need a lot of patience. No, the cold panning life is not for me. Let's dive under the water. With a combination of burnt shenna and a dark tone of ochre, we push the paint into the dark foundation. The right technique is to keep it mellow, so don't do the, sh the edges too sharp. Under those stones it's really dark, so 
give it a bit of black and later we will fade it in. Keep the balance between dark and light. I think that's the best technique of painting rocks under the water. And how do you get all these techniques? Well, I often sit at a lake or river with a sketchbook and first of all I do a lot of looking. I look at the stones and other stuff what's lying around there, then I start drawing. Maybe just a simple stone or a branch, tree, tree stump, it doesn't matter. Everything is okay. This is how you learn how structures are built up and it's excellent for your eye-hand coordination. Even if you sit in your own garden or balcony or maybe if you sit in a city park, whatever, you can do little sketches. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Just let the pencil scratch over the paper and above all it's a very rest giving experience. I did a lot of traveling and if you're lucky enough to be in a place like this, in the cold, bold, naked, almost Jurassic Park surroundings, it's fantastic to listen to the absolute silence which I mentioned before. And I'm still building up the underwater stones. It's hard work because the layers are getting a bit muddy, but we move forward. Some stones or plates are deeper under the surface than the others. So we have to do a lot of fading in. Almost done, let's do one more light effect. There's that mountain light coming from the corner there, so let's do the light trick. We put a very light gray vertical in the water and with light horizontal brush strokes we fade it in. And this will give a very cool blurry effect. Don't push too hard, otherwise the effect is gone. Now I want to blur the light on the stones in the distance a bit, because I find the lights too sharp. We can do this with a very small round brush, and now let's do some ripples on the water. Maybe there's a little bit of wind over there, and with a knife scratching a very light grey, it will give an extra dimension on the water, especially on the stones under the water. On water surfaces is always some movement, certainly in a creek with a water stream, or maybe it's the wind, who knows. But like I said before, no pressure, just let that knife do the work. It's time to paint our gold panning friend, but first we take a little break. So sit back. Relax and enjoy. Before we say goodbye, I would like to show you our Academy of Music and Art in Qualicum Beach. I teach their music and art and my wife Els card making and scrapbooking. I would love to show you my paintings just to get some inspiration. And I understand that for a lot of you Qualicum Beach is not next door, but if you happen to be on Vancouver Island, just hop in for a chat and take a look around. And of course you are always welcome if you need some advice about materials, maybe color mixing or whatever you want to know about art and music. My sweet wife Els is a magician with paper and she shows a great selection of scrapbooking and paper art. And don't forget that we offer a wide range of causes in music, painting, scrapbooking and card making. Yes, there is a whole new world, a whole new creative world for you right at your fingertips. Our steady viewers might know by now that I love to support the North Island Wildlife Recovery Center in Arrington with my paintings. This place, founded by Sylvia and Robin Campbell, is a lovely retreat for wounded birds and other animals who need recovery and help. Also a lovely place for inspiration. So if you ever visit the island, take a look in the center and admire all the wonders of nature. Enjoy!
Yes, it's always a pleasant place to get some inspiration. Let's paint a cold seeker. In a case like this, when it's all really small and tiny, we better paint a silhouette as a foundation. We take a small round brush and with black or dark grey, we can make a cool silhouette. Now, there's one thing to pay attention that if you paint somebody sitting or standing at a beach or a lake, whatever, the head always should be at the line of the horizon. You probably remember the holiday photos from your childhood. The horizon always in the middle and the heads of the kids in a totally wrong place. My little sister always took the holiday photos, did not aim right and most of the photos you see only a leg or an arm of me. Or I was totally not on the picture. More likely, probably she hated her older brother, the terrible wise guy who made ugly cartoons of her. And I did. That must have been the reason. In the meantime, I took away a piece of rock what was sticking out of his head. I took it out of the water because it was not really a pretty face. And the pinky can blend it in. Okay, we do a silhouette. We give the guy, but we give the guy a bit of light anyway on his arms and knees. Just preparing. And I know he looks like a statue, but believe me, this works the best. Because the poor guy needs some rock or soil to sit on. With a small filbert brush, we can bring up some grey tones and maybe a bit of ogre tones. Actually, it doesn't matter. Everything will work as long as he can sit on his ease. We always can come back to paint some more shadow, stones, twigs or whatever or stuff that's lying around there. And while the cold hunter is drying, we can add some more lights on the snow in the distance. For that, we can use a phalo blue color with lots of white and see how much you want to do. In the shadow, we can do the same. We can, with more gray into the phalo blue snow color, we can blend in the scratches of the knife and play a bit with light and dark. We can even add more dark indents here and there. It's always good to put away a painting for a few days and pick it up and with a fresh look you notice things you totally didn't see when you were busy. This is perfectly normal. The human brain gets blurred when you work too long on one subject. So see what you want to add and if the underlayer is dry we always can use the pinky as a blender. Actually, it happened to me when I saw the rocks after a few days. I mean, the rocks in the back into the water, sticking out the water for the creek. I decided to blend the colors a bit more and made them more flat. Then I painted a few cracks into the surface and I added some light and ochre tones where necessary. But overall, I made them more mellow. It's time to make this grey statue alive and with a small round brush we start with the face using dark ochre tone because it's in the shadow, in the shadow of the head that is. I always start with dark tones and work my way up to the light. Same technique with the head. Start dark and later we will put up some more light. For the beard and hair we use a grey tone as this guy is an old seasoned prospector, I think. Keep in mind that the light is coming from the right side. When we paint a face so small, it's important that we keep the brush strokes very small too. So step by step we work our way up to the lighter tones till we think it's enough. And I think he has a nice moustache. I admit it was a lucky strike, but we can leave it this way. On the head we can add a few more highlights too. 
and later we will blend this in. And from there we can add lights on the cloth. These clothes were on the average made of buckskin, very strong, warm and practical in this unpredictable climate. In the summer it feels cool, in the winter it feels warm and the clothes of this poor fellow are pretty ragged and old. Again we work with ochre tones as this is a very natural leather color with a touch of burnt shanna. This vest is on the back done with burnt shanna and it gives a very natural impression. And sorry for the glittering on the wet paint, but this is hard to avoid in the studio lights. And for the newcomers on the island, let me explain about the episodes which I produce as a volunteer. I like to tell about history and animals, this in the first place. And as I traveled all over the world, we did episodes about Europe, Africa and lots of other places. And now we start a series about the history of Canada. We will travel through the provinces and territories, tell about the history and pick an interesting subject of the province we visit. And like I told you before, this is not a tutorial, but an impression what you can do with paint and art, just feeling good. Just feeling good to produce an awesome artwork together. So we started the new year on the top of Canada with the Yukon and the amazing story of the Stampede or Gold Rush, a legendary period which draw an incredible amount of people to Dawson, the center of the universe in those days. In the meantime, I gave the cloth a few ripples with light and dark tones. And I faded the ripples out with a small, tiny blending brush. Very convenient. Try it yourself, it's very useful for all kinds of ripple stuff. Then we can paint the gold pen with a rusty color. We can combine English red with burnt sienna and this will give a great rusty illusion. With fellow blue color and a bit of white we can paint a light impression of muddy water. I told you before I tried this cold panning myself a couple of times and the trick is that you let the water go in circles and pay attention to the black powder. With some luck you can see the glitter of the gold swimming along with this black powder. Well. Not me, I'm still a starving artist, but it was great fun to do. We can paint his hands, which are probably covered with buckskin leather hand clothes, with a light ochre tone. You know, it's all very, very small, but with a tiny round brush, it will work out fine. And maybe it's a good idea to practice hands separately if you want to do more portraits. It's a special technique and not really very easy. We can give the gold pen a few more highlights and do the same with the arms. Highlights will bring the life in your painting. So we do a bit more at the edge of the pen and the cloth and then I think it's time that we give the guy a bit more land or soil or rock to sit on. But before we do this, let's take a little break and watch my impression of Dawson. I made it specially for you. Welcome in Dawson City. It's 1898 and this city is boomy. The summer in Dawson City is short. So if you want to set your claim and start digging, well, this is the office. A bit messy, but that was common in those days. Now, coal digging is one thing, and if you are lucky, you might find something. But the real winners were the entrepreneurs who started a general store where the miners could buy their stuff against crazy prices. And there were the saloons 
and theaters. Yes, Dawson had it all. The gold diggers made long days, but by law, the RCMP had ordered that the Sundays were free and nobody was allowed to work. Hi Pete, getting a drink? Yeah, I'm going to the saloon. I have a dry throat of all the coal dust. Okay, I might join you later. See you then. Yes, this was the life of the average gold hunter. Work, work, work till you drop and relax in the saloons, spending all the hard earned money. And the next day it started all over again. Fellas, hi Pete. Did you leave your guns home today? I sheriff? No worries. I don't even have a gun. Uh, watch your dog, sheriff. A horse doesn't like doggies. See what I mean? Hey, back, back, back. Oh, now we have it and I can chase my horse, oh boy. Now you gonna get that horse from me, sheriff. It's all your fault and that dog. Okay, Pete. Okay. Doggy, let's get that horse. Now that's more like it. The sheriff running after my horse. And he will never get her. Certainly not with that dog. <laughs> Oops, that didn't work out quite well. Let's see what's going on there. Oh, my poor horsey. I will throw that sheriff in his own jail. Dawson City in the summer was not too bad, but I must not think to go deep under the ground just like that and then 10 hours digging in the rocks. No way. But in 1898 it was business as usual. Growing up in Amsterdam, I never dreamed that I would visit a wild west town like Barkerfield or Dawson and other fantastic places. As kids in, in the narrow streets of Amsterdam, we were always playing cowboys, inspired by the great westerns on television in those days. As boys, we had no clue how it was in reality, as we were living in a relative comfort zone like a safe and heated condo in Amsterdam. And what a breathtaking adventure must it have been immigrating to your, from your hometown to a total unknown new world, almost another planet and not knowing what to expect or what to get. There was no orientation possible, no internet, no Skype, no Zoom, and you never saw your family again. And all the brave cold hunters who arrived in this almost alien hostile planet must have been frightened to the bone. When we, my wife Els and I, traveled from Amsterdam to Vancouver Island, we were very well prepared. We were lucky enough able to visit Canada a few times, so we had an idea how it really was to live here and what to expect. But even well prepared and even that we had a very warm reception by the super friendly local people, it was still a culture shock. But in this case, a very pleasant culture shock. We felt home right away and still are. Comparing to the immigrants of 100 years ago, we had an easy move, and when I made this episode and read about all the struggling of those poor people, I consider myself very lucky to live in this blessed time. Yes, there are always a few glitches in every time slot, but comparing with those gold hunters experienced, man, we are living in sunshine. I'm very happy to show you the history of Canada in the next 10 episodes. Have fun, be happy and enjoy. We finally made it. 
A gold hunter is sitting on his rock, fishing for some gold nuggets with his cold pen. I hope you liked it. Check out the website and keep on painting.